Senate uh, Energy and the Utilities Finance and Policy Committee to order. It's Tuesday, March 22nd, uh, 2022, approximately three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, today we're going to uh, learn about uh, nuclear power going forward within our country, perhaps our world. And uh, we've got uh, several speakers. Look forward to hearing uh, what they have to say about this particular subject. Uh, certainly an important one. I think a lot of people do feel that uh, nuclear power is part of the equation going forward with respect to a clean energy future. And uh, so uh, again, uh, this is going to be, I think, an interesting and informative afternoon. So our, speak, uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Gole, the professor of nuclear science and engineering from MIT. And I believe he's with us virtually. Are you with us, uh, Professor? Yes. Okay, please introduce yourself and proceed as you are ready. Okay, hold on for a moment. Okay, um, so um, you introduced me. I'm a professor in the Nuclear Engineering, uh, Science and Engineering Department. I've been there for uh, several decades and I work on energy and environment. <clears throat> and um, one of the things I do that's relevant to your hearing today is to run a very large course. Um, it gets about 90 students uh, a year on um, energy and environment. And, and it began about 25 years ago, focused on a range of uh, topics, uh, but all having to do with sustainability. You know, essentially, how do we meet our needs without ruining the world we will have in the future? And so it was focused on uh, regional air pollution, strip mining, um, the various things that uh, people pay attention to. Over time, the focus has shifted much more strongly to climate change. And so that's what I'll speak about today, essentially reflecting interests of the students who recognize that this is going to be a crucial topic to deal with during their lifetimes. They, they want to find out what's the story on it and how should they approach it. And what we teach them, we, we look at all the energy technologies, uh, we get lectures from all over, mostly MIT, but also the Boston collegiate world. And um, we, we try to avoid the beauty contest between technologies. So we don't tell them that uh, renewables are going to solve all their problems and you know, they wouldn't need nuclear, for example, or vice versa. But rather, we try to teach them how to think about energy propositions, because we know that they're going to be faced with them for a long time. And that's really where I'd like to make a contribution today. So concerning nuclear, uh, often the, the question comes up, well, do we need it? Can we get along without it? Excuse and me, Professor, could you, would it be possible to uh, either maybe get a little closer to your microphone or... Sure. Or if you can turn your audio or your microphone up on your computer, that might help. I've just done uh, that. We're, that we're straining a little bit to hear you. I just did that. Does it help? Okay, we'll continue and we'll see how it goes. Okay, um, right. Okay, so uh, essentially uh, the question that I just posed, I, I submit is the wrong question. And it may, a version of that may be before your committee. The important thing is you have to recognize that if you're going to deal with climate change, you have to get off of fossil fuels. And based on current trends and expectations, you've got between 50 and 60 years to do that globally, not in Minnesota, not in Illinois, not in Massachusetts, globally. And that means all the people living outside the U.S. have to be influenced by whatever you choose to do. And if you don't get, succeed... What happens is that the temperatures that you achieve uh, at whatever time you ask don't go down. It's not like the sun goes down at night and things cool off. The world stays hot, and that'll be the case for more than a thousand years. And the reason for it is that the carbon that ends up in the atmosphere stays there because the mechanisms for taking it out are weak. And we talk about man-made carbon renewal and things like that, and the fact is it doesn't work. I mean, we can take carbon out, but we can't do it at a price that we can afford, at least so far. So nuclear power and all the other technologies actually enter this problem in terms of factors which will affect the probability of being successful in decarbonizing. And so anytime you eliminate one element from the portfolio, what you do is decrease your probability of success and of getting into a permanently heated world. And so that's the way to look at nuclear energy. 
it's not about whether you have to have it. Uh, people hate being told that they have to do much of anything. It's whether they whether you'll be better off if you set up the decision making so that you eliminate the possibility. And there are political groups who would like to do that because they've reached the conclusion that nuclear power is something that should be avoided. I'd say this is a relic of uh, thinking in the 70s when the world was different, conditions have really changed. And um, the tragedy concerning nuclear energy, especially in the United States is that the technology can become much better than it is today for dealing with the climate change problem, but we're not spending anything like the money to achieve solutions that will be as attractive as they could be. Uh, in other parts of the world, people are doing a better job on that. And this is a, essentially a problem of collective decision making. It's not a question of geniuses and laboratories coming up with magic ways to do things better. In other words, we know pretty much how to proceed on this. The question is whether we'll do it. And so I submit for your group that that's the question facing you as well. And I've outlined here the primary um, arguments about why including nuclear in a portfolio of all of the above is smarter than not doing it. It doesn't guarantee that you'll still be successful even if you do what I just said, but the odds that you'll be successful will be imp improved if you increase the diversity of the portfolio. And that's everything that I have to say. So I hope you heard me. <laughs> Yes. Uh, is that it, Professor? At uh, this point, uh, we just open it up for questions. I, I could questions. go on. I could go on for hours, but uh, I think the best use of your, <laughs> of your time is probably to go to questions. Um, sure. Especially if there's something that I just said that doesn't make sense. Uh, members, any questions to the professor? This point, can you, Senator Eric? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, professor, as, as you look at the, the future, um, what are some of the emerging technologies that you see uh, from nuclear that are, are viable options that uh, should be considered in the portfolio? Well, the big problem with nuclear that we have today is it's derived from submarine propulsion technology, and it's, it's been adapted pretty well for making electricity. But we're looking for something that will substitute for all of the fossil fuels in the world. And that means a much greater scale it means producing energy products that are much more diverse than just electricity. And so there's a range of technology types. Almost all of these have been tried out and have already met the test of practicality. Um, whether they're in the best form that they could come is what you do with a development program. And so the first thing is not to focus on particular reactor types, but rather to focus on whether we're putting sufficient energy and resources into integrated programs to give a range of products. So what I mean by this is that uh, if you're gonna do the substitution that I mentioned, you want energy products uh, where you have heat at high temperature. The reactors we have today give it at low temperature because that's good enough for making electricity. What you have to do is get away from just electricity. The other thing you have to do is recognize that if you don't meet that 60 year deadline that I mentioned to you, you're screwed. Um, it's not going to go away. This isn't going to be argued uh, politically. Uh, th this is just the physics. Um, and so you want high temperature, you want high capacity, that is lo lots of energy production. The idea of small is beautiful really doesn't fit this problem. Um, and so uh, there are a bunch of reactor types that can satisfy that. The, uh, they range from uh, sodium. The, the choice of the coolant is the important thing. And it ranges from sodium to high temperature gas like helium um, to molten salts. These have all been demonstrated. We know that we can make them work. The really the question is how, how well will they stack up against each other? And we haven't spent the money to have a really good answer to that. This is basically a national thing and actually an international one. It goes well beyond individual states. And I submit that the world has to be on a footing such, such as you saw in World War II, where you have very vigorous international collaboration in both creating options and cooperating in spending the wealth that's needed to change the energy infrastructure. This is a tremendous uh, change in the way that we do business. And largely speaking, we're sleepwalking. Every day that goes by is a day that's lost. 
And, and so I, I'm trying to answer your question, but I'm trying to put it into what I see as a broader context. Um, uh, and uh, continuing, if you want a symptom that we haven't gotten the memo, look to see if we're continuing with the types of technologies that we've been using for the last 50 years. If your answer is yes, then that tells you that we, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, none of this is a uh, military secret. It's just a matter of deciding what your goals are and putting the resources to make them happen. The individual states can benefit by recognizing their opportunities in this, but they're different ones than simply looking for winners and losers in the marketplace. You've got to view this as a world which is not governed by the profit motive, but rather by survival in the way that you do with war. When you're in a war, you don't ask whether you can afford an aircraft carrier, you find the means to have it. And that's, that's where we are on these things. And so in answer to your question about the technologies, I've given you uh, three examples. There are, is a broader set available, but you don't know which way to go until you've done more homework than we've been able to do. And it's a symptom of the fact that we've just been sitting around in denial, we're arguing about the wrong questions. I don't know if that helps, but that's my point. All right. Uh, uh, Professor, may I just follow up on that? Uh, are you suggesting that uh, that uh, moving forward with uh, you know small small nuclear modular technology and so on should wait on, until some of this additional uh, work is done? If I could be the benign dictator, that's how I would do it. Um, you can make a case for many units of low capacity, uh, such as we see with um, uh, transportation, especially aircraft, you can meet your goals with small units, but it's very hard to get there. You have to go from essentially a basis of zero up to something of the strength that's needed for the international energy economy. And that takes a lot of time and money and patience. Um, so you can't out answer this definitively. Uh, but my, I would go for much higher capacity reactors where the goal is to substitute for fossil fuels. The small modular reactor thing is essentially an, a, a romantic appeal to people who think that if it's small, it must be more benign. So it's really a political argument. It's not a technological argument. You can, you can, uh, make, Matthews. You can make small reactors that'll work all right. The question is whether they'll really help you get to your goals. Senator Matthews. Uh, Mr. Chair and Professor, I was going to ask a similar question on just advanced technology reactors and the scalable size of all of them. And so that was kind of my question as well. Uh, I don't know if you've got uh, additional thoughts on that. Uh, I know that that uh, we're considering uh, this here in the near future. and. Uh, uh, maybe, Professor, and the reason why uh, we're bringing it up here in Minnesota is uh, Minnesota's had uh, a statute in place for multiple decades now to just as a complete moratorium on all more nuclear development. And so we're going to bring a bill here in the near future to consider, uh, and we've, we've made efforts to repeal that nuclear moratorium here in the last few years, and those have been unsuccessful so far. We're going to try with a new uh, a new aspect in the near future of exempting uh, the small scale uh, nuclear developments from the moratorium, so that we can at least have those conversations. But uh, I don't know if you've got insight on those as a policy. Uh, maybe you think that nuclear moratoriums. Uh, uh, maybe you could comment on that or how uh, how the small uh, advanced nuclear reactors uh, might play a role in that if states like ours have such a moratorium in place. Sure. Professor? Right. Look, these moratoria came about during the 1970s and they were part of the reaction against nuclear energy, against big governmental programs. They weren't really based on anything to do with meeting your energy needs. And the cost of doing it in those days was very low. Today, we're looking at a very different future. And if we stay with those old policies, we're just digging ourselves into a deeper hole. Uh, societies have a right to be stupid if they wish to. But, um, and we've got plenty of examples of it. 
Um, but uh, it, if you don't if you don't repeal this, that's the surest sign that your state is is not serious about saving the planet. Um, and uh, so that's not to do with the size of the reactor. Whether the reactor is big or small, it doesn't really matter. Um, and the things that motivate these moratoria are not really linked to the size of the reactor. It's just what will have popular appeal. Um, and I've told you I would go for larger reactors because I define the problem to be solved as that of getting off of fossil fuels. You know, it's, um, you can say that uh, you can provide more employment if you use inefficient technologies, but uh, I don't think it's a smart thing to do. We're talking about saving the planet. Um, so I'm not quite answering your question. I mean, permitting smaller reactors to be built in a way is dangerous because it can be a distraction from the important point. Uh, and, and it gives the illusion that you're actually doing something. So uh, anyway, I've told you the way I would go if I could manage it. Sir Matthew, any follow up? Anyone? Yeah, Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so do you envision this larger scale, and you said it can't just be focused on electricity. So do you envision that these larger scale reactors would do multiple source of power, whether like creating some electricity, some hydrogen, um, a combination all at one facility? Is that kind of where you think the technology might go? Professor? That's, a, that's a, a vision of the possibilities. I don't think we know enough to know what path we would want to take. But you got to remember that energy, non-electrical energy is three quarters of all energy. So if you're really good at making electricity and you're not good at uh, coming up with substitutes for which we burn fossil fuels, you're still missing the target. Um, and so um, you might say that specialized reactors focused on one mission versus another could make some, some sense. Um, that probably does. Um, I. If, if I could do it, I would look at uh, a diversity of goals and figure out where the best fits are. But the first thing is to start working on getting those answers. We're not doing that right now. Uh, look, at, look at what the renewables do. They make electricity. Nuclear today makes electricity. Every, all the technologies you're talking about make electricity. And that's partly because we're set up to regulate the electric industry. And uh, so there's more of a role for government in that. But that's, that's not meeting the physical problem that I outlined to you in the beginning. So it, it's not that you have to do one of these things. There, there can be merits in different options. But the first thing you got to do is recognize the need to create options. And as long as we uh, don't try to do that, we're just getting older and closer to the deadline. Right, any follow-up on that one? Uh, Professor, you know, the, the reason... I believe that we have moratoriums is, are, is maybe a couple of them. Uh, certainly a concern about safety and a concern about uh, what do we do with the waste. Uh, can you comment on both of those? Uh, yeah. Maybe starting with safety uh, from the standpoint of uh, is nuclear power safe? I would say yes. Look, we've got 450 power reactors operating around the world, and they largely stay out of the newspapers unless the Russians are shooting at them. Um, and that's been the history of nuclear energy for the last 50 years. We've had some incidents uh, where it's were very scary. Three Mile Island and Fukushima come to mind. Uh, but in fact, nobody got hurt. Um, and that's no guarantee, as they say in the investment world, about the future. But most of nuclear power is a manageable problem. Nuclear waste is definitely in that category. And this is one of the reasons why the anti-nuclear camp loves it so much because they can oppose any real solution to nuclear waste without being irresponsible because no one's getting hurt by it. And so you'll often find green groups who will say, I'll do anything I can to make sure we don't get a nuclear waste solution because that will enable still more power reactors. That's implicit recognition that uh, this whole waste anxiety is bogus. Um, it's, this is a problem that has been managed and we know how to manage it. And, Nuclear waste, are, uh, they're toxic materials. They're not good to have with you in the biosphere. And they are in a category of things that are both chemical and biological. And what you do is isolate them from the biosphere. Uh, but the track record on this has been very good, except in places where the rules are viewed as being advisory, as in the former Soviet Union. Um, so most of this goes down to how societies behave. It's not really about the hardware. but. 
uh, you have to say that uh, the, the uh, nuclear uh, waste materials are dangerous and they have to be controlled. So I submit that it's a manageable problem. And, and that's one reason why if you search your memories, you cannot find a good example of someone getting hurt by them. As far as safety goes, that's a more serious problem. And we've recognized that you have to put the right resources and practices into place. It's more about people actually than it is about hardware. And one of the most uh, revealing conversations I had concerning nuclear safety came when I went to the Daya Bay nuclear power plant in China. It was the first one. And I asked the plant manager, what's the biggest headache in running a nuclear power plant in China? His immediate answer was mama hu hu. And you're saying mama what? And it's Chinese slang for who cares? It literally is horse, horse, tiger, tiger. And the big problem is that when the staff come to work every day, they don't do a brain transplant when they come in the gate. And so you've got to have a culture where people behave in a, a compulsive, serious way. And that's what happened at Chernobyl. You had a, a team of cowboys who viewed the rules as being advisory, and they destroyed the reactor, as well as killing some scores of people. Um, so it, it's clear that there is a danger. Um, and the real question is whether you can create the conditions to manage it. Uh, you're not going to get absolute guarantees that safety is always going to be assured because you're dealing with humans. Um, and that's true with almost any human activity that you can think of. Um, and we've also learned how to make these reactors safer. The ones that we have mostly uh, were built before some of these lessons were learned, but we've learned them. And um, I'd say we know how to do it better. We don't know how to do it perfectly because, as I said, you're dealing with people. Um, and so it's, it's a judgment call. I wanna suggest you've gotta go back and ask yourself, why, did, why do we have this phobia about nuclear energy? And I know you'll be really surprised when I tell you that it's because of the Vietnam War. And the reason was that nuclear power became a political target when people were looking for ways to oppose the Vietnam War. And one way to do it is to oppose the war and the other is to attack big governmental programs where you can undermine the argument for legitimacy of the government. And that's where the, that's where the nuclear uh, opposition came from. So you have to ask yourself whether we should be governed today by priorities that were developed during Vietnam. Anyway, that's my, that's my view. I lived through it and uh, that's, that's what I conclude. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Anyone else uh, for the professor at this point? Uh, uh, professor, are you uh, going to uh, leave us or are you gonna hang on for a while? Uh, uh, well, it turns out there's a parallel hearing in Illinois this afternoon. And so I'm gonna go over to that for okay. roughly the same purpose. Great. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony and, uh, and sharing your thoughts on this subject with us. Yeah, uh, so let's move on. Uh, so we have uh, Mark Nelson. He's the director of Radiant Energy Group. Uh, Mark, are you with us uh, virtually? Am, yes. Hey, everybody. I'm calling in from Chicago. OK. Are you on a phone or are you? Uh, no nope, you... computer. I should have my video going. Uh, yeah. See you yet, but uh, uh, Mr. Nelson, just uh, please proceed as you're ready. And now we see you. Sure, um, and thanks for having me, everybody. I also was listening to Dr. Golay's testimony, so I have I have a sense of what questions have been asked and then what I can address and add on to. I'm Mark uh, Nelson. I'm Mr. one Nelson, of Nelson. Would you just introduce yourself uh, for the record? Yes, I'm Mark Nelson. I'm 32. I live in Chicago, Illinois, and I am an energy uh, consultant, an independent energy consultant. And I consult to um, industry, nonprofits, and governments on clean energy in general, though my specialty is in nuclear energy. I have degrees in aerospace and mechanical engineering and Russian language from Oklahoma State University, and then a nuclear engineering master's degree from Cambridge University in the UK. Um, I've been mostly working in the environmental nonprofit area since I've graduated with my, with my degrees, um, mostly in California, and I've moved back to the Midwest where I grew up in uh, uh, 2021. And the, my topic that I'm supposed to address for you guys today is specifically on those pressing questions that we heard from the last speaker, what to do with the nuclear waste and are nuclear reactors safe? So um, we had pretty good answers on both of those, but I thought I might share something of interest uh, to the committee 
on if am I able to share slides? Well, please, please feel free to, you know, be uh, all right. You know, if you want to continue on those two subjects, please do. Sure. So on if I can then share screen here, I'm going to share this and share some of my favorite photos of nuclear waste. I'm going to go ahead and launch this now. Um, there we go. See them. All right. So this is my colleague, Paris Wines, uh, a young environmental activist who works for me and is based out in California. Whenever we go visit a nuclear power plant, she insists that I have to tell the group that we're visiting that we demand to go see the nuclear waste. And when this is in Palo Verde nuclear plant in Arizona, she said, if I'm going with you, we have to go in to see the nuclear waste. The utility that operated it said, hey, well, we don't normally let people in to see the nuclear waste. We don't know about that. And so I'm a nuclear engineer. And I said, well, you know it's not dangerous. So do you think you could look into it? So they applied for a rule change with the NRC to let us go in and stand next to the nuclear waste. That illustrates two kind of interesting things. One, it's not the, the fear of nuclear waste isn't really about the, the safety of being around it or being near it. It's about the fear of the public that nuclear utilities have. Nuclear utilities are terrified of the public. So fortunately, since I'm not in the industry, I'm able to work on them and say, hey, if you let people go stand next to the nuclear waste, I think you may have a breakthrough in understanding. So my colleague Paris here is standing next to nuclear waste that represents uh, several million people's worth of electricity supplies over about a one year period. And it's all right there in that fairly small canister. So what you're seeing is about uh, 5 million people's worth of electricity over about 30 years. And that's, that's what the containers are around us. Here's, a, here's another view. Um, and so we ask, we ask our host something like, what would happen if somebody tried to take this spent nuclear fuel? And they say, well, it, it'd be hard because each one of these things weighs 100 tons and it has no moving parts. There's no, you can't just like unscrew it. There are specialized crawlers that come along and lift these things up. They're as heavy as an M1 Abrams tank. So unless you get Ukrainian, uh, a bunch of Ukrainian farmers working together, you're not going to be able to move these things at all. So what's inside is the spent nuclear fuel rods from generating electricity in the reactor. Now, there has been controversy at many American nuclear plants and including in Minnesota that says, wait, if we were going to make a place to put all of these cans and move them away, what happens now that that's been blocked at Yucca Mountain? Well, it is a very interesting question. Although Dr. Gole is correct that there's not really a, health risk from the from the spent fuel as isolated from from the biosphere like this it is a concern for people locally and people are right to be concerned are we paying some cost in property value or in health that other people should be paying it is a serious issue which is why i wanted to bring up another another set of pictures from a trip last fall um, the dutch have very interesting and pragmatic ideas not just about nuclear safety, but about climate change. They are one of the highest population density, lowest countries on planet Earth. If they suffer sea level rises, it's not about trying to call a big uh, meeting and see if they can get concessions from China or whatever. They have to build a sea level uh, protection device, a sea level protection system, or they perish. And they take a similar really hard pragmatic line on nuclear waste. So here's their nuclear plant. It's been going for 40, 45 years. And across the street from it is the most advanced nuclear waste facility in the world. And they just offer tours to school kids, to, to friends. In this case, I knew a gentleman from Southern uh, Netherlands who knew the director and said he could get us in to take a look, even though it was during COVID. So we went in. And the first step is that they have a museum of nuclear waste, where they have a museum of the history of radioactivity, talking about nuclear medicine, early nuclear scam drugs, nuclear dishes, all sorts of things that are lightly uh, or seriously radioactive to explain to both children and the interested public what is actually the problem and how is it secured for human well-being. And here you see the different levels of waste being shown to us, including these canisters, those big concrete canisters, which you'll see more of later. 
So here we have a diagram of this facility. Now, this facility has just been constructed under the tenure of this director of national waste management right here. Um, he just thought that it'd be good to have a solution to the waste. So they had this site and they've constructed different buildings for the different levels of nuclear waste. What you see is the entrance center here with the cafe and the museum. And then you walk out and see the different levels of waste in increasing levels of radioactivity stored in different facilities. And then finally, this, this orange building here labeled E equals MC squared, um, very clever from the, the Dutch have a bunch of very clever architects and designers over in Amsterdam and they hired the best to come help them design a facility that not only protected the nuclear waste, but explained to the public how they were being protected. And this costs a tiny fraction of the amount of what Yucca Mountain was gonna cost. Not that Yucca Mountain wasn't gonna be safe, it's just Nevada felt that they were being hard done by having no nuclear power, but having nuclear waste facilities. So let's look at this. This is the interesting thing. Um, I wanna finish up and then take questions on this part. What this gentleman is pointing to is where we're about to go stand and where if you take a trip to Southern Netherlands, you too can go stand on this concrete platform above nuclear waste. Now this building is really thick. You can crash jet airliners into it, missiles, the Russians can attack it. Like there's no, you can't really bust through this building. It's, it's just built really solid. Now that's not even that expensive because it's just concrete and concrete and steel. You just build it thick, no moving parts. It's just really easy to construct dense structures. So what we have here is something even more radioactive than the spent nuclear fuel that my colleague and I were standing next to there in Arizona. What, what is in those metal tubes is the recycled, the spiciest, most radioactive parts of recycled nuclear waste, where the Dutch burn up their uranium fuel in their power plant. They ship it all to France. France chops it up, remixes it, sends some back to the Dutch to burn again, so sends some back to their own plants. And then the waste, the really highly radioactive stuff gets locked in glass. Like it's called vitrification. Um, they lock it into glass and the glass is hot because it's got radioactive particles. Though That glass is gonna be hot for a hundred years or so, under 200 years as the radioactive particles slowly, slowly reduce their radioactivity. Then they come back, put them in here, naturally air comes through with no van fans or vents or anything they just air is drawn through cools it off and then goes up the goes up the chimney stack the hot air so they let us just come and look at the medium medium level waste and if it, if it looks unsafe this guy is a world expert in nuclear waste he knows exactly how safe or unsafe he knows it's safe to visit but he asked paris not to put her hand on it she did put her hand on it and he said hey hey we prefer if you don't, please don't put your hand on it. Um, so she didn't, because that's the level of safety that helps them feel that all of their, all of their um, tourists like us are being protected. We moved on, went through this super thick door. It took about five minutes to open that thing as it slowly, slowly cranked open. And then we walked right in and there we were standing on top of some of the most radioactive waste on planet earth. And if you put your hand down, on that red area, that thick concrete, you can feel a little bit of heat from the hot air coming off the vitrified uh, fission products from the spent fuel. All around, they've commissioned artwork to try to show to the public what's happening. The picture in the background is printed with 24 karat gold, very thin, so it's not too expensive, but the artist wanted to show the decay over time of radioactive compounds that eventually decay into gold if you, if you wait long enough. Um, and if you we're talking about the uranium and the other heavy metals. So it's a way of communicating to the public that over time, eventually everything gets back to nature. And that's the way the Dutch are prepared to show their public that they're doing the right thing. And just a few weeks ago, they announced a big new nuclear program now that their public is gaining confidence that there's something to do with the nuclear waste. And uh, all right, so I'm gonna, stop sharing, take it back to me, and I'd love to open it up to any questions. Members, any, uh, any questions? Uh, uh, Mr. Nelson? Mr. Nelson, where was that facility again? It's in the Southern Netherlands. The name of it is C-O-V-R-A, COVRA, which stands basically for National Facility for um, 
nuclear <laughs> dump or something like that. It's a, it's a little interesting to read as an acronym translated, but it's COVRA. And if you guys want to visit, you'd be able to arrange a visit. You just have to compete with all the school groups that are going through the to see the nuclear waste. And the reason I showed this is because there is something to do with it if you want to. If you want to do something with the nuclear waste, because the risk is so low, you simply open it up to visitors. And what this means is, instead of being uh, this scary thing that can only subtract from property values or is only plays into old antagonism like, are our Native American tribes going to be insulted with this ugly waste being forced on them? Instead of that, you have a place of educational value that becomes a permanent and loved part of growing up in the Netherlands. You go see the nuclear waste. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we can arrange a trip. <laughs> Any questions of the witness? Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, let's move on now to Dr. Ashley uh, Finan, I believe it is. Finan. Finan, I'm sorry. Finan, uh, Director of the uh, National Reactor Innovation Center at uh, the Idaho National Laboratory. Thank you so much. Uh, looks like a beautiful day in Idaho. Thank you, That's Mr. Chair. That's where Chair. you are. <laughs> I am in Idaho. I'm actually not in my office, so I have a picture of my office, and it's snowy here. Um, so this is a an outdated photo. <laughs> okay. But I am in Idaho. I'm glad to be here. I'm Ashley Finan. I'm the director of the National Reactor Innovation Center um, at Idaho National Laboratory. I'm also going to share my screen. So if you just bear with me while I get the slides up, um, I'll do that. There it is. It's working fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so my plan today is to talk a little bit about advanced reactor concepts and, and a, an overview of uh, nuclear reactor safety. Um, and so I'm happy to take questions. I'll try to go quickly through this because I don't want to be off, off topic for you. But um, again, please feel free to, to ask me questions um, during or at the end as you, as you like. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of an overview of advanced fission. I, I think that you're probably familiar with a lot of the attributes of advanced reactors and, and why we're developing them in the first place. Um, Professor Golay spoke to this a bit earlier as well. Um, but in general, they're often categorized in terms of capacity. You'll hear about micro reactors and small reactors. Um, the exact lines are not firm right now in terms of megawatts. Some, some people think micro reactors are 10 megawatts or less, and some think they're 100 megawatts or less. So, um, there's, there's not a hard line there, but in general, micro reactors, small reactors, and if you hear about SMRs, those are small modular reactors that use a modular construction approach, uh, or, or in many cases, you can have multiple units, so you might take three 50 megawatt units to make a 150 megawatt plant. Um, medium reactors and large reactors, and, and most of what we have in the United States today are medium and large reactors. Advanced reactors use a variety of different coolants. So you might hear Ms. Finan, about- Ms. I just ask a question? Yes, of course. Which, which, which of those would be in a nuclear submarine? Nuclear submarines would be, in this case, they'd be in the micro small reactor range. So, so much smaller than the ones we have on land. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the coolants you might hear about, you might hear about gas reactors or sodium fast reactors, molten salt reactors, lead reactors, et cetera. Um, those are referring to the type of coolant being used in the reactor. And I'll show you a picture of that in, in a, just a moment. Um, advanced reactors are, well, and, and just before I get to that, the reason to use these different coolants is to achieve higher efficiencies, to achieve higher temperatures, to provide process heat um, or to provide hydrogen or other other products other than electricity, um, as well as to have advanced safety features and, and other attributes that advanced reactors are achieving through these um, non-water coolants. As Professor Golay mentioned, um, today's reactors that are water-cooled are modeled off of submarine reactors, which, which were water-cooled um, in the United States from the, from the start, really. Um, advanced reactors are, are clean power and targeting high availability. Um, they are being developed to serve diverse markets, so uh, a range of different sizes, um, a range of different temperature profiles and products um, to be able to 
decarbonize the entirety of our energy system, not only the electricity, but also the process heat and other things that Professor Golay referred to um, as being three quarters or two thirds of our energy use. They're also targeting improved safety, waste, security, and, and economics. Um, and there's a, a real breadth of, of activity in the sector right now. There are 60 or more private sector projects, um, about a dozen or so large significant demonstration projects moving forward to demonstrate an advanced nuclear reactor on the ground here in the United States. So um, really exciting time with a lot of opportunities to succeed in demonstrating these advanced technologies so that they'll be available to deploy um, throughout the country. Um, so I, I mentioned on the pr prior slide, some of these coolants. When we hear about advanced reactor design types, I'm, I'm just um, highlighting here that you might hear about high temperature gas reactors. Those use a helium coolant and then a triso fuel form, which is an advanced fuel form that's been developed over the past several decades. Um, and recently a lot of work has been done in the U US national labs to bring that um, fuel to commercial readiness. Um, sodium fast reactors are cooled with sodium. Lead fast reactors are cooled with lead. Salt cooled reactors can have a um, solid fuel with a molten salt coolant. And then there are molten salt fueled reactors where you actually have a liquid fuel um, or a molten salt fuel, it's dissolved in the coolant. Water cooled reactors are what we have for the most part today. And there are some advanced designs of those as well. And there are a few other variations. When we think about US nuclear energy safety, um, the first place to start is really the oversight uh, for US nuclear energy safety. And that's with the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, the, and that's, I'll call that the NRC. So the NRC licenses and regulates the nation's civilian use of radioactive materials to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public health and safety and to promote the common defense and security and to protect the environment. And the NRC is an independent regulator and considered among or if not the very best in the world. Um, I wanna highlight a few of the NRC's principles of good regulation. Those include independence, openness, efficiency, clarity, and reliability. The most important one there is independence. Having an independent regulator is vitally important to the credibility of our industry and to the safety of the industry. And, and again, you heard Professor Golay speak to the situation when you don't have a credible and firm independent regulator. You need to have that um, it needs to, I forget his words, but he said that, um, you know, the, the laws are taken as a suggestion or, or something of that, that sort. That's not the case here. We have a very strong regulator. Uh, the NRC approaches safety with a philosophy of defense in depth. And so all reactors in the United States are also designed to meet a philosophy of defense in depth. And that means using multiple independent, diverse, and redundant layers of defense so that we're not dependent on any single system to work properly. We have um, a, a backup system or a, a different system that would meet our needs if, if the main means of providing safety fails. The way that the NRC provides regulation over US nuclear safety um, is shown in the diagram on the right in, in order of the numbers. So regulations and guidance, NRC sets forth the regulations that our designs and operations need to um, adhere to. They take care of licensing, decommissioning, and certification. So they evaluate designs and, and ensure that they meet the safety standards. Um, they provide oversight of operating plants. Every single plant in the United States that's operating has resident NRC inspectors on site every day um, ensuring that, that operations are going appropriately. The NRC helps with operational experience. So we have this fleet of about a hundred reactors and we want to ensure that if we learn something at one plant, um, we're able to apply that to all of them. And if things are learned internationally about a design, then we're going to make sure that that comes back to the United States and is applied and shared with all of the other reactors of a similar design. Um, and then there's a support for decisions. The NRC has a research function, um, risk assessment and performance assessment and some other activities that help support the rest of the regulatory framework. So nuclear energy safety basics um, are what the NRC is, is working to ensure. 
Um, they're working to ensure that we present, prevent offsite release of radioactive materials. And when we think about the risk of radioactive release, that's the likelihood of the event times the consequences or severity of that event. So in order to reduce risk, um, safety principles are, are seeking to both reduce the likelihood of an event, as well as reduce the consequences of that event should it occur. And um, this, is, this is a simplified description of, of nuclear energy safety. I'm focusing here on a primary concern, which is damage to fuel and then subsequent release of radioactivity. There are other elements of, of nuclear energy safety that we concern ourselves with in design as well as regulation, but this is kind of the, big, the biggest part of it. So I wanted to cover that. There are several possible causes of fuel damage, and most of those relate to overheating within the core. Um, and so as I, as I just noted, there are other goals, other concerns, and other causes of issues, but I'm focusing on these that I've highlighted here because they're um, really of the, the greatest importance um, and the greatest contributor to safety. So this is a, a diagram of a traditional pressurized water reactor. This is the design in many of the reactors that we have in the United States and many of the reactors around the world. So um, I'll note here that on the left-hand side, you have the um, purple system, which is the primary reactor system. Um, and then the red square in that is the reactor core. That is that along with the containment structure, that gray box dome around it is what's unique to nuclear power. Everything else on the right is similar to any thermal power plant. You have steam generation, you have a turbine generator, cooling and, and a switch yard and you create electricity. Um, it's that element on the left that represents what's nuclear in this system. Um, and that little red box it is the core and that's where we're trying to keep the fuel from overheating. Um, and that's where all the energy gets created through fission. So this is a traditional design. Um, this here shows two of the advanced reactor designs. And I'm gonna start with the one on the right. It's a sodium cooled fast reactor. Um, here, the core of the reactor is shown in that bottom pool. Um, there's a kind of a U-shaped element that is the reactor vessel. And then inside that, if you can read it, there's a core and the core is quite small, um, but relative to the rest of the reactor, but that's the sodium cooled part of this reactor. And then everything else is what you saw with the pressurized water reactor. It's the um, steam generator, the turbine and the electrical power, and the, as well as the cooling. Um, so very similar to a PWR, pressurized water reactor, but with sodium as a coolant in that yellow area of the reactor vessel. And then on the left-hand side is a very high temperature reactor, or what we call in the United States, a high temperature gas reactor. Um, this one is, this, this shows the core on the top right. There's a reactor vessel, and you can see the, the graphite reactor core here. Um, this is helium cooled. And it's very similar to the prior two, but in this case, they're, they're showing a hydrogen production plant instead of electricity production. But the same thing's going on. You're creating heat in the core, you're passing it to a working fluid that's doing work for you, which in this case is making hydrogen. Um, so the difference between a traditional reactor and an advanced reactor is fundamentally not, um, it's not enormous. These are similar designs. Um, but with some innovations that make a really big difference. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we prevent fuel damage. Um, and then I'll talk about how we prevent the, if, if there is fuel damage, how do we prevent any release of radioactivity? Um, the key, key elements for preventing fuel damage are controlling the reactor power, making sure that it shuts down when we need it to, um, and maintaining cooling to the fuel. So when we have a traditional light water reactor, a pressurized water reactor, for example, um, there is inherent safety in the reactor physics design so that as the, if, the, um, if you have an accident condition where, for example, um, there's not enough cooling, maybe you've lost power to the, the site, um, then your, um, your coolant water will start to get warmer. And then a natural feedback is that the, fission reaction will slow down and shut down. So your reactor is automatically going to shut down in the case of um, in a loss of, of power. And there are a number of active systems that, that provide that same shutdown capability. 
you also have these mechanical shutdowns, which include control rods and injection of boron, which absorbs neutrons and shuts down fission. So those are some traditional approaches to controlling the reactor power, and those are used in today's plants. And, and here we have both um, passive safety features as well as active safety features. When we look to the, the next column, the right-hand column, um, advanced reactors have some innovations and enhancements. So in addition to the traditional approaches, um, in some cases we have online refueling or the use of a fast spectrum, which can enable you to have lower um, reactivity in the core, less extra fuel essentially, um, so that it's easier to shut it down. That said, the traditional approaches work very well. Um, so, so the enhancements are less important here than I think in the next section, um, but there are enhancements. When we look to maintain cooling, um, the traditional approach is active cooling. In a light water reactor, it's important that you keep water in the core and that you keep that circulating. So there are several um, backup water injection systems in order to, to keep water in the core. Um, and there's a containment spray system where if water is leaking into the containment floor, it gets sucked up into pipes and then sprayed back down on the reactor. So a very active way of ensuring that there's water on the fuel. Um, backup diesel generators are used to make sure that you have pumps in operation because this relies on the use of power to run pumps to circulate that water. And this is, this is where we've seen um, some vulnerabilities. So for example, at Fukushima, this was the vulnerability that, that caused um, the meltdown in the Fukushima re reactors, where the backup diesel generators didn't work, the pumps didn't work, and they weren't able to maintain cooling in that reactor um, or in, in a, several of those reactors. So in advanced reactors, this is where I, I would say we see the bulk of the safety innovations. Um, there is gravity-driven backup cooling. So instead of a, a, pump, um, a tank that needs water pumped from the tank to the reactor, you, a lot of designs place the um, spare water tanks at a, a height above the reactor so that if you need that water, you open a valve and gravity will drive it down to the reactor. You don't need a pump. You don't need offsite power. There are battery backups for some of the key controls and valves so that those will fail in the most safe way possible. So either if they need to fail open to ensure continued cooling, then they fail open. Um, if they need to fail closed to ensure continued cooling, the batteries will make sure that they fail closed. Um, so that's another passive approach. And then passive natural circulation approaches. Um, the, the prior speaker spoke about passive circulation related to cooling waste. Passive circulation can also be used to cool nuclear reactors. Um, and, and most, if not all, of the advanced reactor designs being developed now um, are able to cool based on passive natural circulation, just, just air flow or, um, or uh, gas flow in order to ensure heat is removed. They can do that either indefinitely or for a long period of time, for several days, to give you coping time um, to restore power if that's part of the safety case there. And then we have coolants with higher heat capacity, higher boiling point, and low pressure operation to prevent cooling loss. So um, I spoke about those new coolants earlier on. The Much of their purpose is that they do have high heat capacity. Water boils at a very low temperature, relatively speaking. Um, sodium does not. Metal, sodium is a metal it doesn't boil at, at the temperatures that you see in a nuclear reactor. So that's one of the approaches here is that if you don't boil off your coolant, then you're going to maintain it in the vessel. Um, if you're able to operate at low pressure, then if you have a break in a pipe, then the coolant won't um, energetically leave the pipe. It might leak out, but if you have steam and a break in a pipe, the steam's gonna find that hole and go out of it because it's at high pressure. So operating at low pressure is another way to improve your, your um, cooling maintenance in, a, in an emergency situation. Um, simplifying the design reduces the number of things that can malfunction. So relying more on passive safety, more on inherent features um, and less on operator actions um, and less on active systems that can help us be more reliable and resilient especially when we lose some of those active systems or we don't have the right operator action take place. 
um, and, and you heard Professor Golay speak to safety being largely a human problem. Um, it is, and there's been a lot of work in the US to create the safety culture um, to, to have the humans uh, perform as, as best they can. But another way to improve things is to reduce the, the need for human action. Um, so then I wanted to say a little bit about how we can find radioactive materials. So it is possible for those systems that I, that I described on the prior page to not work, as in the case of, of Fukushima, for example, um, or Three Mile Island. You saw a failure of, of many of those systems and consequently um, you saw fuel that was damaged and radioactive materials that were able to leave the fuel and get into the reactor system. So at that point, what we wanna do is confine those radioactive materials so that they have as little impact on public health and the environment as possible. So one approach to that is to use physical containment or confinement and traditional approaches include these large concrete and steel containment structures that can withstand pressures and impacts um, and also to manage any, any hydrogen buildup. And so that's the traditional approach. In advanced reactors, we see a number of innovations, including having that low pressure operation to prevent coolant loss and avoid dispersion of gases, um, managing chemical interactions and minimizing hydrogen buildup as well by using different materials so that we don't have hydrogen buildup in the first place. And then using some advanced fuels like triso fuel that can retain radioactive materials in the fuel, which fundamentally changes the potential release um, of, of radioactive materials from an advanced reactor. And then reduce the inventory available for release. So having higher efficiency operation allows you to use less fuel. Um, having smaller units similarly allows you to use less fuel so you have less radioactive material. Um, and then online refueling and removal of fission products can reduce, again, the amount of radioactive material that's available for release, release if everything else were to, to fail. So I wanted to just give you a picture of triso fuel um, as well, because I've mentioned it a couple of times, and it's a big innovation in advanced reactors. Um, it's, a, it's this pebble fuel, um, and then these pebbles are put into billiard ball size elements or into uh, graphite blocks. So the, the pebbles are on the left bottom part of the slide and the graphite blocks are on the right. Um, and this design really provides a level of fission product retention that forms the safety basis for high temperature gas reactors. So when you have a high temperature event, you have a melt, or you can't really have a meltdown in one of these reactors because the materials don't melt at the temperatures that the reactors reach in an accident. Um, and that's the fundamental safety principle behind using triso fuel is that you, you really um, forestall any, any possibility of releasing these um, materials into the environment. And that's how we can move from an emergency planning zone that might be 50 miles for today's reactors down to the site boundary for advanced reactors is that these advanced technologies make that possible. So just to summarize, um, civilian nuclear power in the US is re regulated by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Most of the safety measures that we have focus on preventing damage to the fuel um, or should damage occur, preventing release of radioactive materials. And then advanced reactors include some safety enhancements and innovations that rely more on inherent and passive features and less on active engineered systems. Um, and both the traditional approaches as well as the advanced systems implement this defense in depth philosophy that is um, humble and acknowledges that one system that we thought was, was fantastic might fail. And so we're gonna have another level and then another level to ensure that we have multiple independent ways of ensuring public health and safety um, when, we're, when we're operating nuclear energy plants. Um, so that's my, my summary there, and I'm happy to take any questions if you might have any. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fanan. Uh, really appreciate your, your thorough presentation. Uh, so based on that, as a, as a citizen of the United States, uh, uh, what, is, uh, what is your feeling about nuclear safety as a, as a concern that uh, we ought to have? Is it well managed? Yes, um, I, I think it is well managed. I, I think, you know, my my concern as a citizen is is really focused on climate change and um, and how we're going to achieve energy security and energy supply for the globe moving forward. 
Um, and I see the potential failure of, of doing that as being a major threat to our environment and our security in the future. But I have, um, you know, I have two little boys and I grew up next to nearby two nuclear power plants. And um, I'm very concerned with health and safety in general. But I also know that advanced nuclear is very safe, that today's nuclear is very safe. It's the safest form of energy that we have. Um, I know there are concerns about it and we need to address those and, and be very careful, but it is a very, very safe form of energy and I feel very comfortable with it. Thank you so much. Questions, members? Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, can you help us understand, you know, like here in Minnesota, we have a moratorium. We're not allowed to really talk about it. Um, how does that compare with other states? Are you able to work with other states and then also federal regulations that are around you? Um, what, what are your abilities right now to really move forward with any of these technologies in different parts of the country? Dr. Fanat? Great, thank you for the question. Um, so at, at the National Reactor Innovation Center, we actually have the mandate to accelerate the demonstration of advanced reactors because we wanna see, um, we, we know there's a lot of enthusiasm about the potential for advanced reactors to contribute to our energy needs, um, but there's not yet the proof that people need to see that that's going to happen. So our top goal is to demonstrate them and show people that they work. Um, and show them that they're safe and that they can be economic and contribute to our energy future. We have an enormous amount of enthusiasm from the federal government in that, as well as the state of Idaho and other states nearby. So the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program through the Department of Energy is funding the demonstration of several advanced reactors. Um, and, and my organization is involved in all of those as well as more. Um, we are preparing to demonstrate several, several reactors in Idaho, including the, the UAMPS reactor, which is a new scale, light water, small modular reactor design. Um, we're working with the Oklo reactor company to demonstrate their reactor, as well as Southern Company and a couple of others to demonstrate reactors in Idaho. We have the um, Terra Power Company, which you might recognize as being the nuclear company associated with Bill Gates. They're planning a demonstration in Wyoming next door um, and then X Energy is another company planning a demonstration in Washington state. So there's a lot moving forward. Kairos is, is planning to demonstrate a small reactor in Tennessee. Um, so a lot of activity, a lot of excitement, and we're able to work with states. Um, we've been working with Alaska to look at their uh, plans and, and help them identify considerations for deploying nuclear in Alaska. It's new for them. And, and so they wanna understand the technology and understand what they should think about as they consider their next steps. Um, so we're helping them with that roadmap. We also had Montana legislatures, legislators come and visit Idaho National Laboratory um, just last week to better understand the work that we're doing here. And, and you all would certainly be very welcome to come visit Idaho National Lab if you'd like to see some of the facilities and, and some of the plans that we have. Senator Eric. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And then, uh, you know, another one, um, we heard uh, uh, Dr. Golay feels that uh, larger scale would be a uh, you know more efficient um what are your thoughts as far as the large scale compared to small scale medium um just from your research what have, what have, where do you see the future going dr Fernand? absolutely thank you for the question and i i studied under professor golay i took a couple of his classes so it was a delight to see him earlier um I will, I will point back to one of his other remarks. So he did say that larger was better. He also said that we shouldn't take any tools off the table, um, that are you better off with one more tool or one fewer, right, when considering nuclear energy. I think we can say the same thing about sizes of reactors. There is a, a place for very large reactors. There is an enormous need for large baseload energy in the world. But there are also markets where those are inappropriately sized. So I think that it's appropriate to move forward on several fronts um, with several different sizes for the different needs that we have. And I won't, I won't belabor it, but we, we see that in all sorts of energy and other technologies where, where there are different markets with different means, needs and we can meet them all. Senator Matthews, or follow up to Senator, okay, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Finan. Uh, quick question, would you clarify a term that you use pretty regularly uh, was uh, coolant loss. And I wonder 
uh, what you mean on that, if you could expand on that. You know, usually I think of that's the start of some kind of nuclear meltdown in the reactor, uh, but could you uh, clarify that definition, Dr. Yeah. Fernand? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, so coolant loss in today's reactors would mean the loss of water. Um, and you can lose coolant and then you don't immediately have melting. You can replace that coolant and find other ways to cool the reactor. But any kind of loss of coolant is it precipitates an emergency situation where you're trying to restore coolant and maintain cooling to avoid a meltdown. So yes, it could lead to a meltdown if it were to proceed without appropriate intervention. Uh, other questions? Uh, doctor, I, I just, I have one. I, I'm fascinated with the idea of, uh, and I don't quite understand this, uh, uh, molten sodium, molten lead and so on to be used as a coolant. Uh, you would have to get that extremely hot. I, uh, the, the heat within these uh, devices, I'll call them, must be enormous if you're if if you can heat with the, or pardon me cool with molten sodium that's i don't know it just strikes me <laughs> absolutely no that that is the magic of nuclear energy is that there is such an enormous amount of energy in this very small amount of fuel which is what allows you to have these very minimal impacts um you saw mark nelson's presentation on the amount of waste that canister from five million people over you know i, I forget how many decades but um, that's a lot of people, a lot of energy, very small amount of byproduct because nuclear energy is so energy dense. Um, it's very efficient with land use and it has the potential to, to really help us meet our energy goals, largely because yes, it is, it is very energetic, um, really, really magical. Uh, doctor, you said it was safe. Uh, what about the other argument relative to, uh, to waste and managing that waste? So I, I don't have too much to add to what um, what Mr. Nelson and, and Professor Golay stated in the area of waste. Um, you heard from them that there is a technical approach to managing waste. Um, there are other countries that are moving forward to manage their waste. And, and actually, from my perspective, it's always been a, a selling point to me that nuclear energy manages all of its waste. It doesn't put it into the the air, it doesn't you know, dump it somewhere. We manage all the waste of nuclear energy in the United States. We don't yet have a final disposal site, um, but we know how to get there. And I think that I'm really excited about a number of the things that are moving forward on um, in the United States now, including the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy or ARPA-E. They recently had a, a call um, for innovations in waste called Onwards. And in that Onwards program, they're working to develop technology that will re result in a 10X reduction in waste volume or, or in footprint of the waste. So 10 times reduction in the amount based on those technology innovations is their goal. Another thing that, that I'm very heartened with is the movement of the Department of Energy towards a consent-based siting um, approach to nuclear waste management. And I think that that's what we've seen work in other countries. Um, and it's really positive that we're seeing that move forward in the United States. Good. Any further questions, Senator Eric? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And around this uh, waste, um, we've heard some um, discussion too with what you're doing that there's still a lot of energy potential in the current waste. Um, is that something and potentially how much energy is still available in what we call waste today? Dr. Kunet, Kunet. Thank you, Senator Rarick. I'm sorry. That's a great question. Um, there is an enormous amount of energy still in the waste, you know, greater than 90% of, of the energy could still be in the spent fuel. So there is the potential to reuse that through recycling or reprocessing. And we have technology to do that, but there are efforts in the laboratories to develop better technology to do that that's more, um, more affordable than the previous technology. Right now, it is cheaper to just use fresh fuel. Um, but that doesn't mean that will always be the case, nor that does that have to be the approach. Um, I think the one other thing I want to share is that for some of the work that we're doing at Idaho National Laboratory, we are taking spent fuel from one of the um, research reactors that operated on site and recycling that to use in the initial advanced reactor demonstration. So we're actually doing that at INL on a very small scale. Um, and then as far as the 
the energy value in the waste, aside from it being you know, 90 or more percent, um, the, the spent fuel that we have in the United States right now from today's operating fleet, it would be able, if we reprocessed it to, to reuse it, we could power the whole country for over 300 years is the, the figure that I understand. Now that's not necessarily practical, but it is an enormous amount of, of energy. So I appreciate the question. Great. Anyone else? Uh, doctor, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And uh, you've given us a wealth of information, which uh, again, uh, I'm just noticing some of the side commentary you can't see. It's uh, very impressive and thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and, and best Great. of luck. Okay. Moving on then, uh, let's uh, move to Eric Meyer. Uh, Mr. Meyer is the founder and executive director of Generation Atomic. And uh, he is with us in person. Welcome. Thank you. Please have a chair, uh, get comfortable and introduce yourself and proceed as you're ready. All right. Uh, Chairman Senjum and members of the committee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Eric Meyer and I'm the founder and executive director of Generation Atomic. It's a pro-nuclear environmental organization based in Minnesota, but active across the country and internationally. Uh, we organized grassroots efforts that significantly contributed to nuclear power's inclusion in the EU green taxonomy and protecting uh, about a third of Illinois' carbon-free electricity that comes from uh, some nuclear power plants there. Uh, I'm also a city councilor in Falcon Heights, where I work to address climate and environmental challenges with our environmental commission. And I'm here today in support of lifting the nuclear moratorium and exploring Minnesota's options for reliable, affordable, and clean electricity from atomic power. I grew up in the southwestern corner of Minnesota on the Buffalo Ridge, a place jokingly referred to as the Saudi Arabia of wind energy. And uh, I was a big fan of wind energy for the good jobs it provided to our rural community and its carbon cutting potential. Uh, but I had to come to the realization that wind and solar can't do it alone. We need low carbon electricity that isn't dependent on the weather. Our nuclear power plants have been providing that for decades. And the fact that nuclear power has the smallest environmental footprint as an in-depth study by the UN Economic Council of Europe recently concluded makes the case for nuclear even stronger. The scientific consensus for nuclear also includes recent reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change their scenarios for a carbon-free future show a two to six times increase in nuclear energy. Uh, father of global warming awareness, Dr. James Hansen agrees saying uh, we need, quote, we need to decrease carbon emissions by several percent a year. I don't see how we can do that without the help of nuclear power. France, Sweden, and Ontario provide real world evidence for that statement. They were able to largely phase out fossil fuels in their electricity sectors in less than 15 years using a combination of large nuclear plants and hydro. Meanwhile, Germany, which is turning away from nuclear, is more reliant on fossil fuels than ever and has seen its electricity become the most expensive in Europe. New reactor designs offer an opportunity to build nuclear plants at an uh, even faster rate than a lot of countries have been able, like China and Korea, in recent years. Companies like New Scale Power and Terra Power will soon manufacture reactors and factories at a rate of perhaps 100 per year, shipped to where they are needed and dropped into the footprints of retiring fossil plants. Uh, concerns regarding nuclear waste have been a common objection to using nuclear power, and that is understandable considering the legacy of nuclear weapons waste. But commercial nuclear power is a completely different and separate story. All the spent nuclear fuel in the US could fit on a single football field, and none of it has harmed anyone. And no, it doesn't glow green. Scientists and engineers are confident in our ability to safely store spent nuclear fuel. Uh, in fact, they're doing it in Finland, uh, opening a deep geologic repository just next year. Uh, and that fuel could be recycled in new reactors, as uh, some of our, our previous speakers have, have said. Uh, meanwhile, every year that we don't use nuclear exacerbates climate and air quality issues, predominantly in low income and communities of color. We mustn't let our concerns over hypothetical risks 
thousands of years in the future prolong the very real impacts and injustices from burning fossil fuels that we face today. Indeed, it was my current state senator, John Marty, who wrote the bill and championed the effort to establish the nuclear moratorium back in 1994. And I, I can't blame him. He was following the lead of national Democrats like John Kerry, who pulled the plug on our advanced nuclear research program that same year. And now I hope that just as John Kerry and the National Democratic Party did in the last few years, the Minnesota DFL will reconsider its long held opposition to nuclear power. The voters certainly are. A 2021 poll from Eco America showed that 60% of Democrats now support the use of nuclear energy to help fight climate change and air pollution. 60%, that's up from 37% just four years ago. This is a fantastic opportunity to work together to address climate change, but our state energy policy, the moratorium, doesn't even allow the possibility of more nuclear energy. But it's not just about climate change. It's about providing a just transition and good jobs for our fossil fuel supported communities. A job at a coal plant pays on average about $34 an hour. It's a pretty good job. For solar and wind, it's $24 and $26 an hour, respectively. A nuclear job pays about $42 an hour on average. So that's the difference between making about $50,000 a year for renewables, $70,000 a year for coal, and about $85,000 for nuclear over the course of a year. If we try to replace those jobs with wind and solar, we're going to see a precipitous decline in standards of living across the state. And the number of jobs is vastly different. A 1,000 megawatt coal plant uh, provides about 107 permanent jobs. Uh, for solar, it's 36. Wind is about 80. Nuclear, on the other hand, more than double the jobs of coal at 237 and much higher pay. Again, this is what Minnesotans deserve. And right now, this future is illegal in our state, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, there are currently 12 states that have nuclear moratoriums, and this number is decreasing quickly. Kentucky, West Virginia, Montana, and Wisconsin all lifted their bans in the last six years. Connecticut just had a hearing discussing partially lifting their ban and New Hampshire is slated to discuss it uh, this session. Uh, Illinois, believe it or not, is discussing repealing their nuclear moratorium today, this very day. These projects take a long time to develop. So if we want nuclear energy to be an option when our coal plants are ready to retire in the early 2030s, we need to be proactive. That is what Dairyland Power Cooperative in Wisconsin is doing. They entered into a cooperative effort with NuScale earlier this year to explore the potential of small modular reactors to provide energy to the half million people in four states, including Minnesota, that, that they uh, currently serve. If Wisconsin still had their moratorium, I don't think this would have happened. The Biden administration has made nuclear energy a critical pillar for their clean energy plans. Uh, strongly supporting both existing and next generation reactors in, in the uh, Investment in, in Jobs Act. Um, and we need as much clean domestic energy as we can get right now. So let's lift the moratorium and give Minnesota a chance at the future it deserves. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Meyer. Any questions of Mr. Meyer? Questions? All right. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, for your testimony. Uh, you. Mr. Isaac Orr, please come forward. Uh, fellow with the uh, Center for American Experiment. Welcome, uh, Mr. Orr. All right. Thank you for having Introduce me, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Ready. My name is Isaac Orr, and I'm a policy fellow specializing in energy and environmental policy at Center of the American Experiment. And today I'm going to be giving a presentation about why nuclear power is superior to wind and solar on key metrics like national security, reliability, affordability, and carbon dioxide emissions. So from a national security standpoint, the entire nuclear supply chain could be domestically produced if we had the political will to do so. In contrast, 80% of the solar panels produced in the world come from China. Many times they come from Western China where they're manufactured by 
uh, enslaved Muslim Uyghurs who work in factories powered by coal. Uh, also need to remember that the vast majority of the metals and minerals used for solar panels, wind turbines, and batteries uh, are either mined in other countries, not Minnesota, or refined in China. Uh, this is from the International Energy Agency. So you see copper, nickel, cobalt, lithium, rare earths. Uh, those processing facilities are dominated in China. So we don't want to get in a situation where we are as beholden to China for our energy as Western Europe currently is on Russian natural gas. So from a reliability standpoint, you can't beat nuclear power. Uh, in, or in 2019, Minnesota nuclear power plants produced 97% of their potential output. Uh, in contrast, wind produced 32.6% of its potential output and solar panel 17.3%. So let's, let's make this a little bit more um, accessible to everyone. Uh, if you thought of this as a glass of beer, right? Minnesota's nuclear plants would be 97.2% full, whereas wind and solar would be mostly foam. So uh, where's the beer? <laughs> so uh, it's not just on average that energy is important. It's actually more important when we have extreme weather uh, conditions. So this is a graph from the International Energy Information, or Energy Information Administration showing wind generation during last February when we had the polar vortex. So the red line is the potential output of wind. The blue line is the actual wind output. And then this green line down here is the actual generation from Minnesota's wind fleet. So uh, we see for several hours during February, uh, Minnesota's small little nuclear fleet produced more uh, electricity than the entire uh, wind fleet in 15 states, right? The 15 state MISO region. That should never happen because there's 13 times more wind capacity on the regional grid than there is nuclear in our nuclear capacity in Minnesota, yet that wind fleet was only producing 57% of the energy that the nuclear fleet was doing. We need to talk about reliability. And people say, well, what about storage? And I say, well, okay, Wood McKenzie says that there is going to be about 741,000 megawatt hours of battery storage available globally by 2030, which is 1% of Minnesota's annual electricity consumption. That means the total amount of batteries installed throughout the entire world won't be able to power Minnesota for four straight days. That's a problem. So when it comes to affordability, you can't beat Minnesota's existing nuclear power plants. Uh, well, maybe the coal plants that we should, you know, maybe keep open a little longer. But uh, Prairie Island, one of the lowest cost sources of power in the state, uh, it's half the cost of new wind and new solar. Once you take into consideration things like you need more transmission lines, the utility makes a profit on building new wind and solar, uh, and the load balancing. So keeping those natural gas plants for reliability online. Uh, so nuclear also provides a superior value to wind and solar. Uh, so a wind plant generates about a third of the power of a nuclear plant and a solar facility generates one fifth of the power. So if you wanted to get the same amount of electricity, you'd have to build three times as much wind or five times as much solar. There's a cost to that. Also wind turbines only last for 20 years and solar panels only last for 25, whereas nuclear plants can last for 80 years. So let's just look at this from a cost basis, right? So if you just look at the cost of building one megawatt, wow, so our nuclear is way more expensive. But when you account for the, you know, the fact that you need to generate the same amount of energy, solar is now more expensive, even to build it once. When you look at doing that over 80 years, providing that same amount of power, solar is much more expensive, and so is wind, than building that nuclear power once. So build it once, build it right, build it nuclear. Uh, so from an emission standpoint, uh, this is natural gas generation during that polar vortex. So when the wind dies down, the natural gas generation goes up. Obviously, burning natural gas uh, generates CO2. It emits CO2. So if we had had 22,000 megawatts of nuclear power instead of 22,000 megawatts of wind, we would have had a nice straight green line here, and that would have all been emissions-free power. So we really need to make sure that we're investing in the things that make sense to invest in. Uh, so that's why I think nuclear should have unanimous support. It gives conservatives the things that they care about, like secure supplies of affordable, reliable energy, and it also decarbonizes the grid. So I'm happy to take any questions. Good. Questions for Mr. Orr? I, uh, I think not. I think. All right. <laughs> we're, no scathing we're, rebuttal? Uh, Come on, guys. Uh, information out, I think. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, 
Members, uh, thank you very much for being here today to our testifiers. Uh, thank you so much. A very informative hearing, I thought. And uh, we just move forward. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday. The meeting is adjourned.